Chapter 36. Heart. 8.30 p.m. James and Dave's stuff was going back to Cherub Campus in the grey surveillance van. John was helping James carry everything downstairs when Lisa Tarasov bumped into him on the balcony. What's going on, James? James was holding a portable TV. The cops arrested Dave at the same time Pete and Leon got nicked, so I've got to go back to the children's home. Permanently? I guess. James nodded solemnly. My social worker just blew her stack. I was only allowed to live with Dave if we behaved ourselves, but we've been here less than a month and we've both been arrested. Dave's already on parole, so he won't be coming out in a hurry, and I can't live here on my own. That's really sad, Lisa said sympathetically. It was nice having you two around. You livened the place up. The TV was straining at James's arms, so he put it down on the ground between his legs. I think I upset Hannah this morning. I sent her a text, but she didn't reply. Lisa nodded. Hannah phoned me. I got the whole story, and you'd better not be cheating on her. She's been through a lot this past year. James shrugged. She'll be better off with me out of her life. I think she still likes you. Yeah, but I'll be in a children's home. A few weeks after that, they'll ship me off to a foster home, and that could be anywhere. It's better just to leave it. You know, fond memory in that. John emerged from the flat, holding a sports bag filled with Dave's clothes. Come on, James. Help me out here. James looked at Lisa and felt sad. I'd better go. Tell Hannah that I said I'll always remember her, okay? Lisa nodded as James picked up the TV. I will. So is Max about? James asked. Do you reckon I should stick my head in your flat and say goodbye to him? I wouldn't, Lisa said. It's a nuthouse in there. Max is sobbing his little heart out about Uncle Leon and Pete getting nicked. Auntie Satch is really upset because bloody Sonia started a big row with her, blaming Uncle Leon for everything. James smiled a little. That explains why you're out here. I'm sorry about your uncle. Sonia's right about one thing, Lisa shrugged. Uncle Leon's like Teflon. Nothing ever sticks to him. He'll probably be home in a few hours. I hope so, James lied. Anyway, I'd better carry this downstairs before I do myself an injury. Yeah, later James, Lisa said, as he waddled towards the staircase holding the TV. Thursday, 12.02am. James was heading up the M11 in the van when his mobile rang, Hannah calling. He stared at the display, picturing Hannah on her bed, lit up by lava lamps with her orange toenails. He wondered what kind of mood she'd be in and what she wanted to say, but he didn't answer. When the phone stopped ringing, James slid off the battery, pulled out the SIM card and snapped it in two. That's another phone number I don't have to remember, James said, grinning at John but feeling sad inside. John nodded, without looking away from the gloomy lanes of traffic. His eyes looked puffy, like he needed a good night's sleep. James slid a nylon wallet out of the back of his jeans and ripped the Velcro apart. He went down the little zip-up pocket, took out the SIM card he used on campus and slotted it into his phone. After turning it on and looking at the intro message, which Lauren had changed to You Suck months earlier, he flicked through the saved numbers and gave himself a shock. Bruce, Cal, Connor, Gab, Kerry, Kyle, Lauren, Mo, Shaq. Apart from Lauren, nobody on the list was speaking to him. He flicked up to Kerry's number and thought about sending her a text. The kiss had worked two nights earlier, so he figured he should try. But what should he write? He typed sorry, deleted it, then typed it again. After deleting again, he got halfway through I apologise before deciding that it sounded too pompous. James wanted to tell Kerry how she made him feel special, how she wasn't the fittest or most beautiful girl in the world, but that he wanted to be with her more than anyone else. James realised what he really wanted to say and typed it out. 
Kerry, I love you. He spent a full minute with his thumb over the send button before he felt brave enough to press it. 12.18am. James's phone beeped. There was an envelope on the screen. One SMS from Kerry. We need to talk. Smiley face. See you at breakfast. K. Epilogue. The Cops. The end of the Cherub investigation into Leon Tarasov was just the beginning for Ray McLad and Greg Jackson of the Complaints Investigation Branch. It took six further months of investigations for their team to root out and gather evidence against 15 corrupt officers who had been based at Palm Hill Police Station over a 20-year period. Five of the 15 officers were forced to resign. Nine others were arrested and charged with serious corruption offences, such as taking bribes, tampering with evidence, and running a protection racket in association with Leon Tarasov. One of these officers was acquitted of all charges. The other eight were successfully prosecuted and received prison sentences ranging between two and nine years. The final corrupt officer, Alan Falco, was not charged with any offence. His testimony was instrumental in successfully prosecuting his former colleagues. Falco was forced to move from his South End home following a series of anonymous threats, an arson attack on his car, and waking up to find the word grass spray painted on his greenhouse. Disillusioned with her police career, Millie Kentner took a two month leave of absence. After considering her options, including an offer to become a handler at Cherub, Millie decided to continue working for the Metropolitan Police. She successfully applied for a transfer to CIB and is now in charge of an undercover squad that specialises in rooting out corrupt police officers. The Robbers Leon Tarasov and Michael Patel face charges relating to the Golden Sun Casino robbery and the subsequent murder of Will Clark. Shortly before his trial was due to start, and in the face of overwhelming evidence, Leon Tarasov pleaded guilty to all of the robbery charges against him and to three others relating to covering up the murder of Will Clark. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Michael Patel maintained his innocence. Following a three-week trial, an Old Bailey jury found him guilty of both the casino robbery and of murder. The judge described Will's murder as the most repugnant act committed by a serving police officer we are ever likely to encounter. She recommended that Michael not be considered for release until he had served at least 18 years of his life sentence. The recordings made during the Cherub Sting operation were used during the trial, but they were presented as evidence collected by Millie Kentner and the CIB team. The role Cherub played in the operation was never revealed. Leon and Michael both suspected that they had been manipulated on the day of their arrest, but were unable to prove anything. It was suspected, but never proven, that Patricia Patel was an accomplice in the Golden Sun Casino robbery. She did face charges relating to the laundering of £220,000 in cash, her husband's one-third share of the robbery proceeds. In the light of her young daughter and previous good character, Patricia received a two-year suspended prison sentence. Her BMW miraculously returned to full working order while the police were questioning her and her husband. Pete Tarasov was briefly questioned about the robbery and released without charge. He decided not to go to university and now runs the Tarasov family businesses with his aunt Satcha. The whereabouts of suspected third robber Eric Crisp have not been traced. Police have issued a warrant for his arrest and are optimistic that they will eventually catch up with him. The rest. The bugs placed in George Steen's car and office by James Adams and Shaquille Dejani have provided some insight into the terrorist organisation known as Help Earth. It was a small part of an ongoing investigation involving dozens of intelligence agencies from around the world. James Adams' return to campus marked the beginning of a thaw in his relationship with his friends. Kyle and Bruce, no strangers to being in trouble themselves, broke the ice. Most of the others started speaking to him again over the weeks that followed. Kerry Chang is back on good terms with James, but she's decided that she doesn't want him back as a boyfriend. 
at least for now.